بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا محمد خاتم الرسل النبيين ونتابعه باحسان يوم الدين جزاكم الله خيرا everyone for joining us today in uh, one of our positive youth development series building identity in youth uh, i'm uh, very happy to have with me here Dr. Isra Bedr, um, she's one of our researchers in the, in the area, and she's been doing uh, a lot of work in uh, specifically identity development in youth over the past several months. Um, back in uh, March, we launched the Gender Identity Resource Center, the first of its kind in the world, where we uh, talked about uh, gender identity from the Islamic perspective and, um, you know, how, um, how our young people are impacted by uh, what's going on around us in, in the world today. Uh, today, inshallah, we'll focus more on just identity in general. Uh, what is it, uh, some of the challenges our young people face and some tips for parents and educators, inshallah, that they can use uh, in their families and, and communities. Uh, so with that, inshallah, we're gonna go ahead and uh, turn it um, over to Dr. Sra. Here, I'll go ahead and uh, just real quick share uh, the slides that we have. So give me one second here. There we go. All right. Uh, at any time during the presentation, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to drop it in the chat. We'll also uh, pause at the end for more engaging, inshallah, discussions and activities. Uh, so uh, feel free to unmute yourself during those periods as well. Uh, so these are the few points we'll talk about today. Uh, what is identity? Different aspects of identity that we have, the importance of building identity at a young age, and how can parents help teenagers develop that sense of identity? And as we know, uh, identity is something that's um, emphasized throughout our deen, the Quran and, and the hadith of the son of the Prophet Sallallahu in different, you know, uh, different ways and constructs and, and um, situations. So inshallah, we uh, will try to touch on some of those uh, today, bismillah. All right, so um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Isra here to kick us off with this first activity, inshallah. You can use the chat box for, for that. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Before we start our discussion about identity, I need every one of you to write down the definition of identity you think it means to him. So please use the chat box now and write what you think identity means. So I'll give you 10 minutes. If you're on a phone, uh, you might need to swipe uh, a couple of times to the left to find the chat box. If you're on a computer, then it should be on your right-hand side on your screen, inshallah. So what does identity mean to you? Just whatever comes to mind. I'll give you another 10 seconds for that, inshallah. Okay, we see here uh, a participation. He is, he is saying or she is saying our beliefs. Identity refers to our beliefs and wh or what we believe in. Okay, thank you. Anyone needs to write anything before we start our discussion? All right, so why don't we uh, go ahead and uh, jump through uh, this area, inshallah. Here Khaled, he, he so uh, Khaled is saying all about Islam and the Islamic values, love for sake of Allah, hate for the sake of Allah. Okay, thank you Khaled for participation, okay. Well, identity means it's a sum of qualities and features that make us unique individuals and distinguish us from other people. It means the set of preferences, values or beliefs we have as just you say and evolve, evolve, develops all over our age, but it really starts in the adolescence period. It's a period when we start to think about ourselves and how we are different from others. And it's affected by many factors like the genetic background we are having, the personality traits we have, the environment we live in, and the society around us. Okay. And we see, we see in the Quran multiple places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala identifies us in different forms. For example, as 
believers, he identifies us as an ummah, as a group of people. He always calls upon us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, as plural. Ya ladina amanu. He also, in this ayah here we see from Surah Al-Hajj, uh, very clearly identifies us as people who submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who accept his commands uh, without questioning it, uh, because we fully believe with conviction uh, in him and his qualities and so forth. Uh, so in this ayah here, ayah 78, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to exert, uh, to struggle for his sake, uh, the way that he deserves this, this type of struggle. Uh, to, to the best of our ability. And uh, it, the ayah ends with, uh, he does not want to put burden on you, but this is the way of your father Ibrahim. So he identifies us with Ibrahim السلام, as our father from a faith perspective. He's the one we're following. Uh, he has called you or named you the submitters من قبل, from before. So even before Muhammad has, uh, has been given the message. This is one example how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala identifies us uh, in, in the Quran. There, there are many other examples. For example, when we look at the story of Isa alayhi salam, when he was born and the people questioned his mother. So she pointed to him and they said, how can we talk to an infant? Uh, he spoke up. He said, well, inni Abdullah. He identified himself as the slave or the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and then he identified, uh, you know, he, he mentioned what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him, uh, made him a prophet and, and gave him the book. Uh, and then he identified himself with his mother. He said, and she is my mother. I'm righteous to my mother. Uh, so there's different ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, refers to the believers in the Quran. But at the end of the day, you know, the key, the core of our identity is, of course, connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the core thing is that we are servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We identify as people who want to please him um, subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, so we'll move on to the next point here. I think we have another example, uh, exercise. So sorry if you want to take this one. Okay, after we identified what, what is identity, we need you now to share with us why it's important to build a strong, stable sense of identity in the earliest years of life. Please write your thoughts here down in the chat box. Confidence comes from how you identify yourself. Yes, actually having a stable sense of identity is highly correlated with the self-esteem and self-confidence, right? Thank you. Building confidence and guides you in the rest of your life. Yes, yes. Building a sense of identity means to have a better self-confidence and self-esteem and to have a better guidance in your life. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Now. Building a sense of identity, okay, I think there is another participation here, helps resist peer pressure and society pressure. Yes, you are right, thank you. Okay, building a sense of identity means that the child is having a smooth transition from the childhood period to adulthood period. He really needs a strong sense of identity to be able to be a healthy, mature human being. As you mentioned, having a a stable sense of identity means that you are not pressured by the society or by, by the peer pressure or friends around you. And you have a code of ethics that moves you towards only the accepted behaviors to your identity. As humans, based, humans behave only based on their identity and the code of beliefs and set preference they have. All right, Jazakallah Khairan. So just to uh, add here, the last part I want to touch on a little bit, um, that human beings are, are nothing more than um, complex systems of systems, right? We, we have uh, a mind, a soul, a body, 
And uh, these are very complex entities or, or systems in themselves. And uh, just like anything else in, uh, in, in, around us, we behave on how we're structured. And we'll find in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts a lot of emphasis on building the human being, building that structure, the taqwa, right? So he talks about the heart and how the taqwa sits in the heart and how we can achieve taqwa through worship, through fasting, through different ways. He talks about iman and ihsan. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also talks about peer pressure and, and surrounding factors, but much less in the Quran than the focus on, on the person, him or herself. Uh, and that's why when we have strong identities, um, the, the person would react based on that identity, whatever it is. When the identities are weak, uh, the responses will be very unpredictable. They can be, you know, whatever uh, that, that structure behaves or looks like. So that's another thing to, to keep in mind, inshallah, that uh, the emphasis should be on building the person rather than shielding the person from uh, the the society or the surrounding environment because no matter what we do it's it's very impractical to shield a human being from the society they live in and we've seen all the prophets the messengers they lived in societies that were corrupt uh, but they carried on their message why because they they continued to nurture their uh, their soul their their structure their heart you know and and, and so forth so sometimes what uh, we've seen in the community what happens sometimes parents uh, assume that because their son or daughter is going to the masjid or the islamic school or some quote-unquote protected environment or visiting another muslim family that they are shielded from whatever you know negative influences around them that might be the case for a temporary period of time uh, but that doesn't mean they're protected because they did not invest in building that structure, which part of it is the identity of, of the person. So as parents, we need to just make sure we have that, that good balance. Uh, yes, it's important also we protect ourselves from negative influences, uh, but what's more important is we build the strong foundation uh, that's there so that if we have that negative influence, the child or the teenager, or the young adult knows how to deal with it and what, what decisions to, to take, inshallah. All right, before we move on, anything else, uh, Sister Surat, you wanted to add about the importance of building identity? Actually, a lot of research has shown that building a strong sense of identity means to have a better confidence and to have a better perception of self-image and to have a better belonging to others. So. Uh, building a sense of identity means that a person has better relationship with himself and the world around him. So building identity is really important in their engage. Yeah, and self-image is so important. Um, actually, around the age of, of 10 or 9, that's when um, a lot of young people start to, to look at themselves and, and self-identify who they are. And it could start in the classroom. Um, you know, if they find they can't answer questions in the classroom, they start to, to think of themselves as not so smart and they identify themselves as, you know, people who are not smart uh, and, and so on. So it's really important that um, we, we help promote that positive image. We're close to our kids understanding what they're going through during their day. Um, you know, it could be things that they're hearing at school, things at home. Um, in, in some of our cultures, you know, some moms uh, kind of jokingly call their kids, you know, certain names or refer to them uh, with certain attributes or whatever. Uh, it might be in certain cultures acceptable, but here in the Western world, and remember your kids are, are raised here in this, this country, they go to the schools here, even if they're in Islamic school, uh, they might not understand that that is uh, a joking or it's not really a serious comment uh, and that does create an identity uh, crack especially at that young age and as they grow that crack starts to diverge and we've seen people in their upper teens early 20s where one major concern they have is oh my my mom keeps calling me you know this thing um, for for her mom and back home wherever that is it's a very uh, acceptable thing, but in this country, the kids don't understand the difference. So uh, cultural differences between parents and children, also especially uh, for those of us who are new or immigrants in the country, uh, it's important to be cognizant of those kinds of things, because again, 
um, the way the society here is, I, you know, building identity is a little different from what we might have been used to in other cultures. All right, so uh, let's move on to the next thing, dimensions of identity. So I'll let uh, Isra here tell us a little bit about what uh, this activity is about, and then we'll jump into it, inshallah. Okay, now we have known about the importance of identity. Share with, with us your identity is formed of what are its dimensions and perspectives. Please write your thoughts in the box. So what do you mean by dimensions, like types or categories? Components. Components, okay. Or the structure, yes. Okay. So what, what are the components of a human identity in, in, in our opinion? All right, so there's one that we hear about in the media quite a, a bit. Uh, I mentioned it earlier on the call, uh, those who, who were with us uh, when we started. Um, okay, so what we think of ourselves and what you think of others. So that's kind of uh, our the definition of identity, but here I think the, the, um, the, the brain challenge here is, is what is, what are the different, um, components. So there's a gender identity, right? How does a person identify themselves from a gender perspective, right? Uh, do they think of themselves? Uh, there could be uh, a racial identity, for example, right? Uh, do I think this is very common? I see it a lot with the Arab uh, teenage boys. Uh, they always question themselves, are, are we Arabs or Americans or Africans? And they tend to to find something to, to attach to, right? So you'll find a lot of uh, Middle Eastern young men uh, identify themselves as African-Americans, not, not necessarily Arab-Americans. Uh, and you'll find others who identify as Arabs, you know, as Palestinians, for example, they, they you know, listen to Nasheeds and from the Middle East and, and so forth. So that, I think that's what the question is, is referring to. Yeah, like gender, age, color, status, those kinds of things. And, I'll let Isra take it from here, inshallah. Okay. Our identity is not a single component or only one perspective. Actually, it's composed of many, many factors that interact together, like our age, the set of abilities we are, the race we are believes in Allah. Or Or how we see ourselves and the world around us. All right, and we have again another example from the Quran, Surah Al Hujurat, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala um, is addressing all of mankind, believers and disbelievers. Oh, you people, we have created you from a male and a female. So here he's identifying the two genders, which are only two, the male and the female. And we've made you different groups and different nations so that you know each other. And so you also know that the most honorable amongst you is the ones who have the most taqwa. So again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is identifying uh, people based on their levels of taqwa as well. He categorizes us in the Quran as believers and disbelievers, right? Or people of the book and other people. So these are different ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala identifies uh, people as well. So uh, obviously in the, in the media recently, and, and we hear a lot uh, about inclusion and diversity and so forth, and this is how society also identifies people by color, by race, by background, and, and so forth. And for our young people, uh, they're always questioning all these kinds of things, right? Um, a, a few uh, weeks ago, I remember four young people um, were talking to me and they said, um, uncle, they don't respect us because we're young. So in their minds, these 22 year olds, they were uh, thinking that some group of people in the community are not respecting them because of their age, right? They, they kind of 
subconsciously got to that conclusion that because they're still in college and young and whatnot, uh, people that the larger community is not taking them serious. Uh, we know that sometimes people feel singled out because of certain abilities they might have or not have. So again, um, some of our youth might have certain physical challenges um, or, or they might be uh, a little in their maturity and growth out of the norm range. For example, you might find some, again, young people in high school who have developed their motor skills very quickly, but their uh, intellectual decision-making, their cognitive skills are a little behind. And, you know, they're diagnosed as youth with ADHD, their attention deficiency, or they're hyperactive. Uh, and and they, they are identified as such. So it's important as a parent, we also understand uh, how does our young person identify themselves? It could be socioeconomic status. It could be family status that um, maybe my parents are divorced. So identify myself as a son or a daughter in a home that has, you know, parents who are divorced uh, or, or whatever the case might be. Uh, and these are important so that when we pay attention to these things, we can prep our kids to face certain types of situations and challenges in their life where they're not caught off guard. Uh, I remember this is a, a really uh, crazy story, but there was um, a Muslim kid in a high school. He told me about a girl in his, uh, in his high school who was not Muslim, uh, and she had two, uh, two dads, you know, two homosexuals created a family and somehow um, they had a, a girl and she doesn't know which one of them is her real father. That's the, the, the challenge. So when she was graduating and she went to be called upon to receive her award, uh, she was confused who is the father to kind of come and, and you know, greet her or whatever. So it was a very, and she broke down and, and was crying and it was a, it was a pretty uh, dramatic situation. But this young person in the community was telling me about, you know, what, what other kids go through at school. So it's really important that we understand how do our kids see themselves as far as was it related to age, their abilities, their connections, uh, their role in life, you know, and, and so forth. Uh, we're also seeing a number of kids in the communities across different parts of the country because of the influence of the media around us, because of what they hear at school and sometimes at workplaces and things like that, for those who have internships, uh, they start to question their gender. You know, there are a number of young people um, that we've come across, they wanted to change their gender or they've identified as one thing or another, whatever. Uh, so it's important that we also discuss some of these things with our kids at the appropriate age. So we're not letting them learn about these things from sources that are not credible or authentic uh, as well. All right, so again, feel free to put any questions you have inshallah in the chat. I'll turn it over back to Dr. Israt to tell us about how to build a stronger identity for our young people. Yes, now it's time to share with you what we believe are important steps to help our teenagers to build their sense of identity. First is positive reinforcement, then teaching them responsibility. Explore open communication, letting them to choose their actions and to try new things and learn, learning from their mistakes. And finally, support their navigation through the process. Before we start, Please share with us your thoughts on how parents can reinforce the good actions in their teens. Please write your thoughts here in the chat box. How can you reinforce the good behaviors in your teenager? Here we can find most difficult show and tell. I think you mean that to model the good behavior, to model, to be a good model for your uh, children. Yes, yes, okay, thank you. Uh, 
and regular and that's, reminders. That's an extremely important point. Um, a lot of young people who uh, leave Islam, it's because they're not um, convinced that it is what it, it is, mainly because someone close to them is not practicing what they're preaching. So for example, we see a lot of uh, youth who don't pray when, uh, when they, we have the Sunday school program and uh, some pr kids say that they don't pray, we ask them why and say, because my parents don't pray. They keep telling me to pray, but they themselves don't pray. So kids uh, recognize that. Uh, I've even uh, heard from a, a number of brothers, they say, we, will, we want to marry non-Muslim girls or girls who are blonde or white or whatever. And when we ask them why, they say, because uh, we don't see our parents having uh, an interesting, you know, spousal relationship. Our, my father doesn't talk to my mom that much, or he doesn't take her out or doesn't get her gifts or, you know, whatever. Uh, so his impression, the way he identifies a Muslim couple is that what he sees at home. He thinks that this is how Islamic marriage should be. And automatically, subconsciously, at the age of 15 or 16, he's thinking, I, I don't want to be like that. I, I want to marry someone who's fun and cool and, and all that other stuff. So uh, this is a great uh, point, which is to, sh to, to act what we say. You know, when kids feel that there's some hypocritical uh, thoughts, they, they kind of decide, OK, I'm not going to get involved in that. Okay, I can see here another participation. And most important, big kids fall in love with Prophet Muhammad. Yes, I think you mean that when we are good models for um, our children, they can think of Islam like um, a good thing to follow and uh, to, to be in love in Quran and Prophet Muhammad Sira. I think you mean that. Okay, yes, that's right. Anything yeah, else? That's, that's great. And, and that one way is to, to show diverse parts of the Prophet Sallallahu life. Uh, sometimes when you open the books of Sirah, uh, you, you find they focus so much on his part of his life where he's the commander of the army, uh, but not so much as the family man or the business person or the community leader. I mean, there's so many roles that the Prophet Sallallahu has fulfilled in life. So also paying attention to how our youth are learning about the Prophet Sallallahu Sirah and the sources that they have. A lot of kids these days, of course, they learn from the internet, you know, just going on the internet. And, and generally speaking, you're going to find uh, more literature on his character as a commander in an army than other aspects of his life, just generally speaking. Of course, there's lots of literature on other aspects of his life, but it's not necessarily uh, the same way of access or accessibility to our youth. So just keep that in mind, uh, because again, uh, the general media around us portrays Islam as a religion that has been spread by the sword and that we're tough people and, and so forth. So it's important that we, we balance that uh, and we balance it with stories, things that we can't just tell the kids uh, the Prophet was a peaceful man or he was a loving husband, but we have to tell them a story that shows that he was a loving husband, that, you know, in the middle of his uh, Sahaba being invited to his house, his wife takes a dish and she smashes on the, on the floor and he just says, your mother is jealous and he picks it up and, and as if nothing happened, right? We, we have to show these stories uh, to make that love a really to the kid logical and something that they can accept. Um, so the, the, the challenge for us as parents today is that our kids are inquisitive and we live in a society that's very scientific based, very fact based, and we have to show them as much as we can why we're saying these uh, statements. All right, great. So let's move on. Uh, first thing I think you mentioned was positive reinforcement. So you want to tell us a little bit about what you meant here, Isra? Positive reinforcement simply means to target the already good behaviors in your child. It means that you are rewarding and praising the good actions of him so that he is going to repeat it more and more in the future. Give, give your full attention when your child is doing the good things means that he wants to repeat these behaviors to get the same attention in the future. So 
this what we mean about positive reinforcement. And, and one point I want to emphasize here is it's important. It doesn't matter what that positive behavior is. It could be something very simple or it could be something major. For, for some of us, a major accomplishment could be that they got straight A's in all their classes. Uh, but it could also mean that they just did their bed that day. You know, um, there's a very popular video out there about the Marines, a commander in the Marines, who talks about why the Marines do their beds every morning. They're, they're on a ship in the middle of the ocean. There's a thousand of them or whatever, but five o'clock in the morning, these Marines get up and the first thing they do is they do their bed. Then they go up to the deck and do their exercises and whatnot. But why would, why would the military care about a Marine soldier doing their bed in a bunk bed that's under the, the, the deck in the middle of the ocean? I mean, who cares, right? But it's, it's all about discipline. It's all about self-reward when when one of the things that the commander mentioned in his video is that after a tough day the marine comes back to their bunk bed and they find a bed that's done so even if they had a rough day they had a day that was not very successful they find a reward a simple reward as simple as as little as making a bed and we know as muslims that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not overlook anything so sometimes as parents, we set expectations that are little not reasonable. They're little ambitious. And this actually backfires uh, quite a bit. I've, I've seen um, members in the community who are in academia, they're accomplished professors or researchers in universities and world-class centers. And they want their kids to be like that. They want their kids to go to college and, and so forth. So at a young age, 12, 11, they start to kind of put them into these rigorous programs and you have to get straight A's and, and they set the bar pretty high. And sometimes the kid is not ready for that or their character and personality uh, might not be fully developed where, you know, this is something they're ready for and it backfires. We find that the kid loses interest altogether in school and they go into a different route. So this positive reinforcement can be for very simple activities, simple things. It could be setting up the dinner table. It could be washing their plate. So maybe as a mom, I'm expecting for my daughter to wash all the dishes today because it's Tuesday night and it's her turn. But maybe she didn't do that and she just washed her plate and her sister's plate and then left. Uh, that's still something that we can do positive reinforcement and, and recognize that inshallah. Just a little example. All right, so let's move on to the next point here. How can parents teach their teenagers to be more responsible? So, uh, Dr. So, if you want to share a little point here, what you um, uh, want us to think about, and then we can uh, dive into it. Responsibility is a very important trait to teach to our children because it ensures that they are having a smooth transition from childhood to adulthood. Being responsible human being means that you are a bit adult in the future. So teaching our children responsibility should start from a very young age with a gradual actions to help them to be more effective family member. So how parents can teach this trait to their teenagers? Please share your thoughts in the chat box. All right, we're trying to keep this interactive. So just any ideas you have, things that worked for you at your home, you know, where you felt uh, it makes your kids more responsible. I can see more participation here, being a role model. Yes, exactly right. It's a struggle, toughest question. Yes, <laughs> parenting is hard, yes. All right, so let's uh, talk about that a little bit more. So maybe uh, we'll, we'll go through this hadith. The Prophet uh, says in a hadith, All of you are shepherds and all of you are responsible for your flocks, right? And the hadith goes on talking about the father, the mother, the child, the employer, the employee. And he ends the hadith saying, indeed, all of you are shepherds, all of you are responsible for your flock. So 
from that we learn, and this, this hadith is one of Ilya's key fundamental principles, that everyone has some role, has some responsibility. If someone has a responsibility, that means they have a role, even if it's a five-year-old. So uh, I'll let Isra, inshallah, share with us some ways that we can create that responsibility, inshallah, that we can share some uh, examples from the community. Yes. To teach your child to be responsible means that you are giving him the chance to be an effective part of the family. It means that you assign him tasks to be done inside and outside the home, which are, of course, teen age appropriate to him. Also, ask him to share in the housework and maybe he can share in the expenses and also in the house budget. All of these stops or, and, or actions mean that he is an effective part of the family. He belongs to the family, so he needs to do something to help the family. It's all about being an effective part of the family, which means that he will be an effective part in the future of the whole community. Yeah, and, and again, some of the things we've found some families uh, fall into is where, for example, the father is giving the son some responsibility. Let's say the son is 11 or 12. But the father doesn't give um, the mother any responsibility at all, except maybe cooking and cleaning the house. And, and the 12-year-old recognizes that subconsciously. They can see that. They, they, they grow up understanding that mom doesn't know anything about finances. Mom doesn't know anything about careers. Mom doesn't know anything about um, you know, shopping for a house, for example, or a car. And hence, um, they develop this idea in their heads that uh, this, what, what, what my dad is trying to do with me is not really building responsibility, but he's just giving me a hard time. He's making, he's making my life difficult. So when we try to instill responsibility in our children, we have to also, again, back to the earlier point we talked about, walk the talk. We have to be consistent, right? Because the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu says, all of you are responsible. It's not just the males in the house or the females. Uh, it's not that the males are responsible for certain things and the females for other things. No, it's we're all responsible and we, we can have responsibility in different aspects of, of life. Now, true, some, some genders or people, uh, one gender over the other might have more interest in certain things, but it doesn't preclude uh, a young man from enjoying cooking or a sister from cleaning her car. There's, there's nothing that is wrong with that. So it's just important that we're consistent in what we're doing. So our children understand that we're building responsibility in, in their character. We're not like punishing them or giving them a hard time or, you know, we're just trying to make them uh, miserable. So that's, that's one aspect uh, to, to do. Another thing is, uh, like Sarat was saying, outside of home. So what does that mean? Volunteering activities. That's a great way to build responsibility because when people accomplish things, they build a, self, a sense of, of worth and that builds their self-esteem and that gives them part of that identity that we're talking about. And, and they recognize that they're responsible for things. So like, um, like Asrat mentioned earlier, age appropriate is very important. If we give our kids tasks that are a little um, you know, naive or, or simple for them, they're gonna get bored. They're gonna feel we don't recognize their abilities. We don't respect them. If we give them things that are too difficult, uh, we might be challenging them and, and maybe deterring their interest or making them a little uh, worried about their abilities and so forth. So it's important to choose activities that are age appropriate um, for, for their, uh, their engagement. All right, any other questions in the chat? I don't see, I think, anything else. I think there's a comment here. Someone seems to show that he's responsible but forgets. Uh, I, I, if I understand correctly, is this referring to a young person? They forget to like carry on the responsibility. Yeah, so that's that's a great point. Um, attention span of, of youth and children is shorter than, of course, an adult. Uh, they could get distracted much easier than many of us. So they might start a task, like you might have your son starting to clean his room, and then he kind of midway just starts to do something else, playing or whatever. And we have the famous story of uh, 
Anas ibn Malik, who the Prophet Sallallahu sent him to the marketplace to purchase something for him. He gave him some money, said, hey, go to the marketplace, buy this and bring it back. And, uh, and uh, he, uh, he went and played with the kids. And he took so long, so the Prophet Sallallahu went out to see, find him, and he found him playing with the kids. And he didn't interrupt him. He didn't, you know, criticize him. He just asked him, do you still have the money that I gave you because I need to go get the stuff? And uh, he remembered. So he said, oh, okay, let me, let me go do that. So it's, it's normal that they forget. Don't take that in a negative way where they're ignoring you or they're disrespecting you. It's very possible that they just got sidetracked. They, they forgot. Another thing is there are also physical abilities are, are lesser than us. So what we might be able to do in 30 minutes, we can wash 20 dishes and 20 cups and do this and that and cook and whatnot, or clean the house, uh, could take them a much more longer time. So they might physically need a break. So it's okay to find them doing the room over three days or whatever. Uh, and that's where you can, I think uh, we'll talk later about coaching. You can coach them to, to, for other skills, how to plan time and, you know, uh, schedule and things like that. All right, so let's move on. We have a couple of things to talk about here. So I'll let you take this one, uh, Sister Sarah. The third trait to help our children to build a sense of identity is encouraging the sense of exploration and the curiosity in them. So can you mention one thing parents can do so this is the second component of instilling identity. So first thing we talked about was responsibility, right? Or I think we talked about something else as well. Reinforcement then encourage curiosity and exploration. Okay. Yes, I think a good participation here, I please travel and expose them to the world around them. Yes, one of the most important is to getting them know more about the world around them. And of course, traveling, expose them to the world, maybe visiting museums or um, go camping. All of these activities can help our teenagers or children to know more about the world. Yes, wonder aloud and promote thinking. Yes, that's totally right. I would, I would like to add to this list also museums are so, uh, are a great resource to get curious, curiosity of young people. Unfortunately, uh, not a lot of people go to museums these days, but uh, there are a lot of museums, especially here and where we live in DC, that are very suitable for children, um, very interesting. The natural, uh, I think it's called Natural Resources or Natural Life Museum, the Smithsonian. Um, they talk about animals, dinosaurs, things like that. You also have museums for uh, uh, the aerospace uh, right across, you know, uh, there's one we take the kids on Ilya trips to on, uh, on medicine and how medicine has developed. But what we found when we take youth to these museums, one, uh, it's a very unique experience to them because they're very used to the video games and the digital world. And when they're looking at displays in front of them and looking at history and seeing physical objects, it's a very different experience. So uh, put that on your list of, of things. Of course, travel. And as we know, our dean encourages us to travel in the Quran and the Hadith and, and the Sahaba. Uh, they all have, you know, mentioned this. But um, there's, there's other ways. Uh, also reading. Uh, you know, reading books outside of school is, is another way. Uh, unfortunately for Muslim youth, there are not many uh, non-fictional uh, literature out there. One of the things we've been trying since we started to the organization is to produce uh, non-fictional books that are, you know, uh, available for teenagers uh, outside of academic books for them to read about different things. Uh, so those are some of the things that, you know, can increase curiosity of, of teenagers. But of course, given the very fast pace of technology, and for us adults, it's a little difficult to keep up with everything, um, you'll find that young people are very curious by, by nature. Yep, reading stories, absolutely. 
All right, so I'll let Sister Isra uh, go through these points here and then we'll close with the ayah, inshallah. As we mentioned, uh, encouraging acceptation and the curiosity mean that you are trying to expose them to the world around them. This can be by inviting them to try new kinds of sports and activities. Maybe they are interested in art classes, in reading books, in cooking events, whatever they are, uh, are thinking is interesting, please you can encourage them to do that. Also to try not to just answer the questions they are asking, but to try to encourage them to share their thoughts first before you answer them and encourage the why questions and how questions. All of this can um, make them try to think and try to understand and to explore more of the world around them. Yeah, these are great points. And um, as the ayah above there mentions from Surah Al-Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the believers who um, remember Allah and mention Allah when they're laying down, they're standing up, they're, um, they're relaxing, you know, they're sitting. And they comprehend or, or, or think, ponder about the creations of the heavens and the earth. And they get to the conclusion, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batilan subhan. Uh, oh Allah, you have not created this in vain. There's, there's a purpose behind it. So very important to, 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 uh, to have discussions with our youth about the purpose of life. You know, we find sometimes um, or quite often people who go through school up to college, they do academically well, they're successful in what they're doing. But that question is why? They just never thought about it. You know, uh, why are we doing what we're doing? It's it, because of the way society is, and, and we always tell our kids, you know, go do your homework, brush your teeth, do this, do that. We don't spend as much time telling them why, why we're telling them this stuff. Like, why brush your teeth? We just tell them so you don't have to go to the dentist. But what's the problem if I go to the dentist? What's the problem if I get, you know, a cavity? There could be other serious ramifications, but why? Why do I go to school? Why do I need to get good grades? It's, it's not about the grade itself. It's not about your career necessarily. At the end of the day, it's about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And making that connection from a young age is really important. There's so many great young people in our community who, who succeed very well in life. But that why purpose connection and the connection with their deen is just not there. So, and that's why we're losing a lot of people in their mid twenties, especially as they're finishing up college uh, from the Dean. I mean, some, some studies have shown in some campuses as high as 40% of the Muslim population leave Islam by the age of 24. In other places, it's, it's 20%. But you go down to College Park or UMBC, any of our local campuses here, just a, a very conservative statistics, you know, 20% of the youth are not, are not even identifying as Muslim anymore. Uh, they might go to the MSA just to grab a burger or eat something, but they don't pray, they don't fast, you know, and, and so forth. So uh, that why question is, is really important. And um, some of these ideas that the group shared here, taking them out on trips to the mountains, you know, having them reflect on nature, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, reading stories, things like that. Uh, even uh, diversification of activities, uh, it's totally normal for youth to try different types of sports. You might find your son or daughter doing soccer, for example, and then they switch to basketball and then they do football and then they do hockey and then they stick around with some sport for a number of years because they're still trying things. They're, they're experiencing, experimenting with different things. So don't be too worried as long as they complete uh, a meaningful accomplishment. Like you don't want them to start two sessions of soccer and they drop it and switch over to something else, but they finish a season or two of soccer, then they move over to another sport and they finish it. Uh, and this is where you want them to, to complete it, right? As long as you're doing that completion thing, they, they should be fine. All right, let's move on to the next one. How can parents help their adolescents speak openly about the challenges they face? So if you want to drop a few ideas and then Israel will walk us through a couple of points, inshallah. Uh, I 
So this is a tough one. Challenges are many, and some of them are getting very complicated. Uh, we need ourselves to learn about these challenges first. So <laughs> I know this is not an easy one. Okay, so there's something here. I open out to them about my challenges so that they feel at ease to come out with theirs. I think that's a good point to discuss that um, having an open, honest communication with teenagers is very important to them and sharing your thoughts and opinions and challenges you're having in, the, in your life can really encourage them that um, they can also share what they are having. So that's a good point, actually. Thank you. Yeah, as long as they're, of course, age appropriate. Uh, however, a lot of parents feel worried that they might discuss certain challenges with their kids because they might like bring their attention to problems or negative behavior. Uh, that's usually unlikely. Uh, your, your kids probably know about these things already. Uh, they just don't know it from you. They know it from school, from a friend, from the news or whatever. So in today's pervasive communication and interaction in the internet, it's unlikely that you're gonna bring your child to attention of something that they did not know. So I don't think that's uh, a concern too much, but the concern could be just make sure it's age appropriate because you don't want also your kid to know something. And then they say, well, you used to do that. So why are you so upset with me doing that? Or you had this problem or whatever. Um, so just be careful to what extent you share your challenges with them. But it is uh, a very important way because it so shows authenticity. And it also shows that uh, you as a parent are courageous to, to share, you know, experiences that you had, whether they're positive, negative, and uh, give guidance to your child uh, about avoiding it. And, and the same, same uh, uh, rationale exists is that if you don't talk to them about it, and they know that you know about these things, they're also gonna, you know, um, lose some trust and, and yeah. So that's, that's a good, important thing. And unfortunately, a lot of parents don't open up with, with their kids. All right, so Sra, I'll let you uh, take this one. Major is very important for them to build a sense of identity them and giving them the space to just share about their thoughts and the problems they are facing in their daily life and to be be non-judgmental to them to share your guidance and your work, but without um, disrespecting them or trying to minimize their efforts or trying to minimize their problems because this can make them reluctant to share with you any problems in the future. We need to be open and we need to be kind and we need to be respectful to their to them whatever they are doing and uh, to be, uh, to show guidance and support we need it. All right, Jazakumullah khair. So definitely open communication is extremely important in, in helping people build identity. If anything, it shows that we respect them, right? Which, which is a positive reinforcement of their identity. So active listening, giving them a chance to talk while we listen to them and then reflect on what they're sharing with us. So let's move on to the next piece here. How can we help our young people become more independent? Um, if you have uh, some thoughts, you can drop it in the chat. Uh, we're running a little short on time here, so I think we'll just go ahead, uh, maybe cover this one, Isra. Okay. To, to help our teenagers to be more independent means that we are not the decision makers for them. And instead, we try to teach them how to make the decisions for themselves. We need to be only facilitators and moderators, not the one who takes the actions and the one who makes the decisions. Let's give them the space to make their own choices and try new things and not to be judgmental about what they are doing, but also to accept that they are trying to learn. So they are they have the right to make mistakes and they can learn from the 
biggest mistake. So giving them that chance and that them have to be independent from their parents. All right, I see a question in the chat here. I think it's saying that a challenge is sometimes the youth uh, or the child doesn't think that the parent believes them. Um, and, and that's just a, a question of trust, right? So for some reason, uh, we've made a statement or an action and the way the young person understood it is that my parent doesn't trust me. Hence, if I tell him or her something, they're not gonna believe me. So just be careful um, how you're communicating with your child. One way to, to rebuild that trust is what we call active listening, which is to paraphrase what they share with you. So when they come to talk to you, before you make any feedback, give them any feedback responses, you restate what they told you in a different way, right? So let's say um, a my child came to me and said, uh, I got a bad grade at school. Rather than responding, I could say, oh, I, uh, I feel or uh, I can see that you uh, are not so happy about that. Did, did, did I understand that you failed your test? You know, so I'm using a question or I'm paraphrasing what they said. Uh, and that's one way or two ways of, of what we call active listening. Uh, and that gives both parties that opportunity to build some trust. You're building, uh, you know, a conversation. So when, when they don't, they think that we don't believe them, it's because we're not giving them enough space to share their feedback as well. And we're, we're like Asrat was saying, we're not coming across as facilitators, but more as decision makers. Go do your room or go eat or do this or that. Uh, whereas you can get the same accomplishment. I mean, look at the story of Ibrahim Sam and his son Ismail, right? He received a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to slaughter his son. And Ibrahim salam was um, a very strong uh, prophet, one of the ulil azm and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognized him as a khalil. He, he could have just said, hey, Ismail, come, I have to fulfill Allah's command, turn your neck and just go ahead and do that. But instead he consulted, he facilitated with his son. He said, I saw in the dream that I'm supposed to slaughter you. So what do you think about that? That's active listening. He's listening to Ismail in the form of a question. And because he understands the personality of his son, he used that technique. Because he knows that Ismail is, uh, salam, is a son who thinks, who gives his, you know, gives some attention to what his father says, and is gonna, you know, think about it in a certain way. So he he consulted with him. Whereas Nuh salam, when the flood was happening, there's no time for consultation. The, the earth is is about to get flooded. So what does he say? Yeah, Bunay, my dear son, jump on the ship with us. Get on the ship with us. And his son uses logic. He says, no, I'll go up to a high mountain, right? There's no time to, to kind of do active listening. So depending on the situation, you're going to have to change your, your communication technique and your strategy. But the general rule is don't come across as a decision maker, no matter how old or young the kid is. Even if it's a three-year-old and they want a lollipop and they're crying for a lollipop. Instead of saying, stop crying, I'll give you the lollipop later or finish your food, you can ask a question and say, would you like to finish your food first? And then I give you the lollipop. And, you know, depending on the response, you can have that negotiation um, discussion. All right, uh, let's kind of wrap it up a little bit here. So um, next thing, share your thoughts on how we can support our teens in their journey. So if you have uh, other thoughts, you can drop it in the chat and uh, I'll let Isra here take us through this navigation piece. Okay. So our children in their journey, they are, have, they are in a bad need for our guidance and support. We need to be around them, but to observe, observe from a distance. As we mentioned earlier, we need to be consultants only, not the decision makers for them. We need to help them, to support them, and to, to give them all of our love and all of our support but from a distance. And we need to put a firm family rules and to be consistent with actions and with consequences of actions. 
and to be providing our guidance we needed to them. This is how can we help our teenagers in their journey from the childhood to adulthood. Okay, so there's a question about working with hard-headed teenagers, and, and this is kind of related to this discussion here, supporting their navigating, going through life and making decisions. Uh, it depends on their age, but um, if they're, let's say they're 15, right? 15 is, is what we call the beginning of young adulthood. They're, they're, they're not young teenagers, they're not 12 or 13 year olds. So you need to give them some space to make decisions. Uh, so what you wanna do here is, is assess the situation. What's the harm if they make a decision and it's the wrong decision, right? Is the harm, the risk, something you can, uh, you can you know, absorb and live with? then let them make the mistake because that's part of how they're going to learn. But if it's not, if it's, if it's dangerous to them or other people, then you need to use logic and explain to them, show them through uh, examples, sit down one-on-one, -on -one, take them out for a walk. You know, uh, There's different methods. We can talk about that. That's sort of a, a different topic altogether. Uh, but depending on what it is, you're gonna to have to find a different communication strategy. It's it's mainly about communication, so it's it's not so much identity. All right, so let's move on here. I think the key takeaways is that identity defines who we are, right? It's the things we believe in and we experience that we we you know we we show, we behave. So it's not just what we believe in, but it's what we believe in and we we practice as well. And it has different components. We mentioned what those are. And you want to start as young as possible to help the child build that positive identity, you know, in, in different ways and, and so forth. Uh, and a key thing here is what we invest into our youth is going to reflect in their identity. So just like any other system out there, human beings behave based on their identity, their structure. Uh, we talked about the key focal point here is that we identify ourselves as connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as, as servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's, that's something important that we instill at a very young age, at the age of two or three, as they're starting to learn, you know, uh, they start to copy us when we're praying and things like that. But then by the age of three or four, we need to explain, you know, why do we pray? The, the why question is very important. So you want to always emphasize the why, you know. Hey, hey, dad, why do we stop at the red light? You know, it's not so we don't get a ticket because we want to protect lives. And why do we want to protect lives? Because we don't want people to suffer just like we don't want to suffer. And, and that why question keeps going on. You know, experts say, keep asking why for six times. Why do we want to do this? Why that? Why, why, why for six, six, you know, times for that one question. Uh, and of course, we have the major role. Uh, most of the problems we see in identity is because young people are confused. They see something different from what they're being told to do, either at home or school, or home is completely very different from school, or the home is not helping reconcile the differences. And gender identity is a, is a great example. As, as Muslims, we, alhamdulillah, we're the only group on the planet that understands this issue. Uh, but the school system is telling them something different. And if we are not, uh, you know, actively, preemptively explaining to our kids why we say something different than what the school is telling them every day, they're going to have an identity crisis. And most kids are not going to have the courage to come and tell us that, hey, at school, they're telling me something and you're telling me something else. Uh, they're just going to hold it inside. And if that crisis, that, that gap keeps increasing at some point, it's going to cause other other issues. So those are the key points we, we took away here. I'm gonna pause, see if anyone has any questions for Sister Isra or myself, inshallah. All right, we went a little over time, so maybe next time, inshallah, Sister Isra, we make them an hour, hour 15 instead of an hour, hour 15, hour and a half to give more opportunity. But uh, I can stick around for another couple of minutes if anyone has any questions, inshallah. Jazena Iyakum, thank you for joining. Inshallah, there was some benefit in this. We'll send this uh, slide deck out to everyone who signed up and also recording of the video. So if there's anything that 
you know, you needed to go back to, inshallah, you have that opportunity. Our emails are also on the screen there. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. And then uh, there's a phone number that you can text or call as well. Um, with that, inshallah, jazakumullah khairan. Allah subhanahu wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruka wa tubu ulaik. Wa al asr inna al-insan fi khus ila al-dina amanu wa amilu al-salihat. Tawasub al-haqq wa tawasub al-sab. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Jazakum Sister Isra. We'll talk soon, inshallah. As-salamu alaykum.